In the last lecture, we introduced continuity, and we used continuity to define the notion of sameness between two subspaces of Euclidean space. However, there's a small problem, because we didn't see any way to prove that two subspaces of Euclidean space could ever be different. How can you rule out the existence of a homeomorphism between two random subspaces of Euclidean space? In this lecture, we're going to see one method to do that, and we'll use the idea of connectedness to allow ourselves to distinguish two subspaces of Euclidean space. In order to define the notion of connectedness, I need to start with a slightly dopey abbreviation. If I have a subspace of Euclidean space and a subset that is both closed and open, I'll call it clopen. That's a little silly, but you still know a couple of examples. If I have any subspace, the subsets empty set and X are both clopens. That's now enough to define the notion of connectedness. A subspace X of Euclidean space is going to be said to be connected if and only if it has exactly two clopen subsets, the empty set and X itself. Well, one immediate corollary of that is that the empty set is not connected. After all, the empty set has exactly one clopen subset. Suppose that I look now at a finite collection of points inside Euclidean space, and I ask whether it's connected. And the answer is no, unless I've only taken one point by itself, the singleton subset. If I look at the rational numbers inside the real line, that is not connected. How can we prove it? Well, Q is certainly non-empty. So what I need to show is that there exist some non-empty clopen subsets of Q that are not equal to Q itself. In other words, I need to locate some non-empty proper clopen subsets of Q. It turns out I have quite a good supply of these. After all, if I take any irrational number X, I can look at the open ray starting at X. That's an open subset of R. So if I intersect it with Q, that'll be an open subset of Q. But since X is irrational, that's the same as what I get if I take the closed ray and intersect it with Q. But the closed ray is, as the name suggests, a closed subset of R. So if I intersect it with Q, I get a closed subset of Q. And now I've seen that this subset is both open and closed. As such, it's a clopen subset of Q. It's not the entire set of rational numbers, but it's also non-empty. Therefore, it's a non-empty clopen subset of Q, and so we've now ruled out that Q could be connected. Notice that in some sense, Q is extremely not connected, because after all, for every irrational number, there are uncountably many of those, I can construct one of these clopens. The real line itself is indeed connected. That certainly matches with our intuitions. After all, the real line here certainly looks pretty darn connected. But how do we prove it? Well, we certainly know that the real line is non-empty. So what I need to do is I need to begin with a non-empty clopen subset. Let's call it S. And I need to prove that that non-empty clopen subset will have to be equal to R itself. Here's the strategy for doing that. I'm going to start with an element of my S, which I know exists because S is not empty. And I'm going to prove that the rays starting at X and going to plus infinity and starting at X and going to minus infinity are both subsets of my S. If I can prove that, then I will have shown that S is in fact equal to R. We're going to look at the supremum over all of those points of Y, such that the closed interval from our x to y is completely contained in s. This is a measurement of our failure in the sense that if n is a finite number, we will have failed. 
So our goal is to prove that n is in fact plus infinity. Suppose not. Well, in that case, n is close to s. That's because n is the supremum of a set of points inside s. Now, since s is closed, it follows that n is an element of s. On the other hand, s is open, so it follows that there is an epsilon greater than zero, such that the open interval from n minus epsilon to n plus epsilon is contained in our s. But that's quite awkward, because after all, n plus epsilon is greater than n. Uh, right, that's exactly right. Yes, this contradiction ensures that in fact n must be plus infinity, so that means this entire ray sits inside our s. And now we can run the argument on the other side by considering the infimum of those w's such that the closed interval from w to x is contained in s. And the same argument will give us that this ray here also lives inside s. And that completes the proof. So the real line is itself connected, and we can ask whether there are any other connected subspaces of r. And the answer is not only yes, but we can in fact characterize the subspaces of R that are connected. Here's that characterization. A subspace X of R is connected if and only if it is an interval. By an interval, I mean a non-empty subspace such that if I have three points in order inside the real line and the smallest and biggest point both lie in X, then the middle point has to lie in X as well. So my claim is that x is connected if and only if x is an interval. So let's begin by proving that if x is not an interval, then x is not connected. So if x is not an interval, then one possibility is that x is empty. In that case, certainly x is not connected. If x is not an interval, but x is non-empty, then there have to be three points, x, y, and z, in order inside the real line such that the smallest and biggest points are in x, but y is not in x. But now we can run a similar argument to the one that we gave when we proved that q is not connected. We can look at the closed ray starting at y and the open ray starting at y. And if I intersect these rays with x, I get the same thing because after all, y isn't a point of x. On the other hand, this is closed and this is open, so now we have a non-empty proper clopen subset of x. That exactly means that x is not connected. So we've proved that if x is not an interval, then it is not connected. Now let's prove that if x is an interval, then x is connected. If x is an interval, then in particular x is non-empty. So what I need to show is that if I have S, a non-empty clopen subset of my x, then that S is actually equal to x. The strategy will be much the same as what I used to prove that R is connected. Namely, I'll take a point of my S, which I know must exist, and I'll look at the supremum of all the possible endpoints of the closed intervals completely contained in S. I'll call that supremum capital N, and there are two options. Either N is an element of X, or N is not an element of X. Well, first, if N is an element of X, then N must be close to our S. But if N is close to our S, let's remember that S is closed, so therefore N is contained in S. On the other hand, S is also open. That means that there exists an epsilon greater than zero, such that the open interval from N minus epsilon to N plus epsilon, when intersected with X this time, is contained in S. Now, X is an interval, so that implies that in fact N is the supremum of X. On the other hand, what if n is not an element of x? Perhaps n is plus infinity, in which case it very much isn't an element of our x. Nevertheless, since n is an interval, 
it follows that n must be the supremum of x. We've shown that n, capital N, must be the supremum of x, and if n is an element of x, then n is also an element of s. Now we can run the same argument for little n, which will be the infimum of the endpoints of the closed intervals contained in s on the other side. When we run that argument, we discover that n must be the infimum of x, and that n is contained in x if and only if n is contained in s. So now there are simply four options for our s and our x, and here they are. Little n and big N could both be contained in S. One could be contained in S but not the other. Or neither could be contained in S. In all these four circumstances, we conclude that S equals X. Now we arrive at an interesting question. Suppose that I have a bunch of subspaces of Euclidean space. Suppose that they're all connected. If I take their union, does that have to be connected? Well, I could imagine having a disjoint union of connected things, but that disjoint union won't be connected anymore. But if I make sure that my pieces overlap, then when I form the union, that union will be connected. So here's the proposition. Let X alpha be a family of subspaces of Euclidean space, and assume that for every alpha and beta, in A, X alpha and X beta intersect. Then if all of these X alphas are connected, their union will be connected as well. Here's the proof. Well first, certainly, X can't be empty. So now my task is to take a non-empty Clopin subset, S, and prove that S is actually equal to X. Now for every alpha in A, if I intersect my S with X alpha, that will again give me a Clopin subset. This is now a Clopin subset of X alpha, but we're assuming that each X alpha is connected. Since each X alpha is connected, it follows that this intersection is either empty or it's X alpha itself. If it's X alpha itself, that means that X alpha is a subset of this S. Now this S has been assumed to be non-empty. That implies that for at least one of the alphas, X alpha must be contained in our S. But on the other hand, we know that any of the X betas must intersect our X alpha. That means that any of our X betas must intersect our S. And so since X beta is also connected, it follows that X beta must be contained in S. Consequently, we discover that all of the X alphas are contained in S, so X itself, which is the union of all of them, is contained in S. We use this proposition in order to construct what are called the connected components of a subspace. Here's how that works. If I take a subspace of Euclidean space, and I take a point, little x, then I can form the union of the connected subspaces of x that contain my little x. I'll denote that with this symbol here, brackets x sub big x. This is a union of connected subspaces, but any two of these connected subspaces intersect because after all, little x is in all of them. That means this is a connected subspace, and it's the largest connected subspace of X that contains my little x. This is called the connected component of little x. Now, attached to our subspace is a set called pi zero. Pi zero of X is the set of connected components inside our X. Notice that if X is connected, then the largest connected subspace of X that contains a point little x is X itself. That means that X will have only one connected component, 
And so pi naught of x in that case will just be a singleton. We're going to return to the behavior of pi naught once we've stated and proved this, which is the first important theorem of topology. It goes like this. If x and y are subspaces of Euclidean space, and if f is a continuous surjection from x to y, then if our x is connected, so is our y. Here's the proof. Since x is non-empty, y must be as well. So now my task is to take a non-empty clopen subset of y and to prove that in fact that non-empty clopen subset is y itself. To prove this, I'll take the inverse image of that non-empty clopen. That's a non-empty clopen now sitting inside x. Since x is connected, that implies that the inverse image of my s is equal to our x. But now recall that f is supposed to be a surjection. So that means that the image of the inverse image of s is equal to s. But on the other hand, the inverse image of s is x. Since f is surjective, the image of x is just y. And so I conclude that y is equal to s. This very short proof is actually providing us with a very powerful theorem. This is the theorem that's going to allow us to rule out the possibility that certain subspaces of Euclidean space are homeomorphic. That is to say, this is going to allow us to distinguish certain subspaces of Euclidean space. Let's watch it in action. The way we're going to use this theorem is to prove the non-existence of certain continuous surjections. For example, we can contemplate the subspace y consisting of those points in the plane such that the y-coordinate has absolute value 1. This is the union of two vertical lines in R2. This is not a connected subspace. If I look at the subset consisting of points of the form x comma 1 and ignore the points of the form x comma minus 1, then I'll find myself a clopen subset of y. So y here is definitely not connected. But r very much is connected, and so our theorem implies that there is no continuous surjection from r onto y. In particular, there's no possibility for a homeomorphism between r and y, and so these two spaces are honestly different. That is, topology has allowed us to distinguish r and y. Let's use this theorem again in a different way. Let's consider the real line and the circle. These two are also not homeomorphic, but you might wonder how connectedness could possibly help you here. After all, r is connected, we've proved that, and s1 is connected as well. So how can we use connectedness to prove that these two are not homeomorphic? Well, you use the following trick. If you had a homeomorphism, r to s1, then you could restrict that homeomorphism to a homeomorphism from r minus the origin to s1 minus the image of the origin. This would have to be a homeomorphism. After all, it would be continuous, and it would be a bijection, and its inverse would also be continuous. But now we have a problem. If this were a homeomorphism, we'd be in big trouble because, after all, s1 minus f of 0 is still connected, but r minus 0 is not connected. So there could be no continuous surjection going that way. And in particular, there certainly can't be a homeomorphism connecting these two. Here's another important fact that we can prove in virtually the same way. The line and the plane are not the same. I'll bet you feel like you already knew that, but now we can really prove it. How does the argument go? Well, if I had a homeomorphism between r and the plane, then I could remove a point from each side, and I would still have a homeomorphism between r minus a point and r2 minus a point. But r2 minus a point is connected, and r is not connected. So they can't be homeomorphic, 
and therefore the line and the plane also can't be homeomorphic. We can get even more refined information. We can count the number of connected components. And that turns out to be an important invariant of our subspace of Euclidean space. Here's how that works. Well, if I have a continuous map, f from x to y, and I consider a connected component of x, that will have to map to a connected component of y. That is, the image of a connected component of x will have to be connected in y, and so it will have to live inside some connected component in y. What we say is that f induces a map from the set of connected components of x to the set of connected components of y. We call this map pi naught of f. Well, what if f is a homeomorphism? If f is a homeomorphism, then the connected components of x have to match up precisely with the connected components of y. There can be no difference in the number of connected components. In other words, this pi naught of f needs to be a bijection. If we have two subspaces of Euclidean space, x and y, and if they don't have the same number of connected components, that is, if pi naught x and pi naught y aren't of the same size, then there's no way for there to be a homeomorphism from x to y. Let's see this idea in action. Here's a simple example. Let's first take the subspace consisting of three balls union together. These three balls here. There are three connected components to this space. One, two, three. If I just take the union of two of these balls, then this will only have two connected components here and here. So what happens if I have two connected components in this space and three connected components in this space, then these things certainly cannot be homeomorphic. Their pi zeros are simply different. As we go further, we can use this idea to analyze pictures of subspaces of Euclidean space. Here I have two subsets of R2. On this side I have the intersection of two line segments. And here I have three line segments all converging to the same point. And these two subspaces of the plane are not homeomorphic. Suppose that I had a homeomorphism that went in this direction. What could I do? Well, I could remove this point right here, the point where these two lines cross. If I remove this point right here, then the homeomorphism that I drew will have to be a homeomorphism between this without the origin and this shape without some point on it. If I remove this point, I'll have four connected components. On the other hand, I'll have to remove a point from this shape so I could remove it from here or here or here or here. If I remove it from here, I only have two connected components. Similarly, if I remove it from here, I'll only have two connected components. And from here, I'll only have two connected components. If I remove the point from here, I have three connected components. But there's no way to remove a point from this shape that will produce for me four connected components. Therefore, this space, when I remove this point, can't be homeomorphic to any version of this space where I remove a point. But that means there can be no homeomorphism from this space to this space, and so these two spaces are genuinely different. Here's another application of our big theorem. You've seen this application before. It's the intermediate value theorem. If I have a connected subspace of Euclidean space, and I write down a continuous map from x to r, then for any real number, such that there exist x and z points of x, for which f of x is less than or equal to t, which is less than or equal to f of z, there must exist a y in x, such that t is equal to f of y. Why does this follow from the theorem that we saw? Well, we can simply consider the image of this x inside r. Since x is connected and f is continuous, that image will have to be an interval inside r, because those are the only connected subspaces of r. And intervals are precisely 
subsets of R with this property. Okay, now just for fun, let's draw some subspaces of R2. I've selected these subspaces of R2. I've found 26 of them here. I've drawn these. You're not supposed to think of the thickness of the pen with which I've used to draw these. So you're supposed to think of these things as sort of individual line segments that intersect in various ways. And what we can ask here with our alphabet is which of these are homeomorphic and which ones are not homeomorphic. Let's look at a couple of examples. Well, for example, I here is homeomorphic to J because I've just simply taken this bottom part and bent it. By bending it at some point in the, in the middle here, I can produce a homeomorphism between I and L as well. I can bend I like this and produce a homeomorphism between I and U. But notice that I can't produce a homeomorphism between I and T. Why is that? Well, suppose that I had a homeomorphism between I and T. I could take this point here and remove it, and I'd be left with three connected components after I remove that point. But there's no way for me to remove a point from I and get three connected components. Similarly, I is not homeomorphic to O, because if I remove a point from I, I'll have two connected components, but if I remove a point from O, I only have one connected component. So let's divide these into classes. Here I have the letters of the alphabet, and I've highlighted the ones that are homeomorphic to each other. But for example, nothing in this class is homeomorphic to anything in this class. Nothing in this class is homeomorphic to anything in this class or anything in this class, etc., etc. Notice that with the font that I've chosen, we have four special letters, B, H, P, and Q. Notice that very many letters here are homeomorphic to our friend I. If I think of T here, T is homeomorphic to E because this bent part on top can simply be unbent in a continuous way. And then I'm left with something that goes straight across here and goes out, and by turning that to the side, I'll get myself a T. Similarly, T and Y, those are also homeomorphic because I can take these arms on the T and just bend them up. Let's see why H isn't homeomorphic to T. Let's contemplate that. Well, suppose that I take my T and imagine that I have a homeomorphism from T to H and I remove this point here. If I remove this point here, then I'll be left with one, two, three connected components. And is there any way for me to remove a point of H with three connected components? Well, hey, yeah, there is, isn't there? If I go right here and I remove that point, then I'll have three connected components, one, two, and three. Uh-oh. Well, maybe I can do something cleverer. Maybe I can take these two points away from my H. If I take these two points away from my H, then I'll have one, two, three, four, five connected components of H after I remove these two points. So is there any way to remove two points from T such that left over I have five connected components? Well, if I remove a point from here and a point from here, for example, then I'll be left with one, two, three connected components. That's not good enough. And the same thing will happen if I remove a point from here and a point from here or a point from here and a point from here. So I better choose as one of my points this intersection point and then if I choose another point, then that'll leave me with one, two, three, four connected components. But there's no way for me to choose two points off of my T to get five connected components. Therefore, T and H are not homeomorphic. So here we have the topologist's alphabet. The topologist doesn't know that any of these letters are different from one another. The topologist doesn't know that any of these letters are different from one another, or these, or these, or these. But these four are different and exceptional. So in all, we have nine different letters of the topologist alphabet. 